Dr. Vanessa Chand is the Chief Commercialization Officer and the Director of the Office of Technology Transitions for the U.S. Department of Energy. In this particular role, she's responsible for all commercialization activities across the Department of Energy, the 17 national laboratories, and the department's other research and production facilities across the country. She clears pathways for the commercialization of innovative technologies, ensuring that the discoveries that happen at these DOE facilities make their way out of the labs and into the commercial marketplace. Dr. Chance has worked with a wide range of companies and ecosystems from academia to Fortune 1000 companies to startups. She is a former McKinsey and company partner who earned her PhD in material science and engineering from MIT and her bachelor of science and engineering in material science and engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. She comes to the Department of Energy on a leave of absence from her position as undergraduate chair of the material science and engineering department at the University of Pennsylvania School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. We look forward to her talk on technology commercialization this morning. Basically, what I wanted to uh, do is, first of all, thank uh, David and Juan for inviting me to come speak to you here. Um, the University of Chicago is a very important uh, partner to the Department of Energy uh, because, uh, obviously, they run two of our labs, uh, Argonne and Fermi. And uh, I had the pleasure of spending the past few days with David really learning more about, uh, especially the quantum partnership, had a chance to visit the University of Chicago labs and the work that they're doing in quantum, uh, had a tour of the advanced photon source, which is an amazing uh, resource at Argonne. And uh, one of the first things I did as the chief commercialization officer was to launch duality. And really what I wanted to do today was share with you uh, some thoughts I had as the chief commercialization officer of the Department of Energy, what I really think universities should start doing in order to get the next generation uh, driving towards uh, impact. David had a chance to uh, share where my background perspectives come from, but I thought it'd be helpful for you in just one snapshot to really see I'm coming from a pretty uh, diverse background. Uh, you know, I come from academia in the sense of uh, I you know, got a PhD and went through all of that. Um, I've worked with really large companies, helping them to drive commercialization. I've also launched my own consumer product inventions um, and so learned to commercialize my own things. And I've spent a lot of time with startups and big companies advising them on how to uh, do this as well. I'm currently on leave of absence where really what I was trying to do was transform engineering education. And what I'm gonna share with you today is the work that I was doing there uh, in order to ensure the next generation can have an impact with the work that they're doing. And the really neat thing is in my new role is everything here on this page was actually, is actually completely relevant, including my uh, time on QVC on the things that I'm doing here at the Department of Energy. But my focus really today is around my vision of where engineering education go, needs to go and why that's the case. So this is actually a pretty uh, personal story for me. Um, because uh, you know, in the key thing for, uh, for this is that I think everyone needs to have a Venn diagram. And so for me, my Venn diagram is technology, business, being a maker, and around all this is education. Um, I think everything we do, including the work I'm doing at DOE, is educating, getting people on the same page. And it's a personal story because I had a really hard time um, uh, thinking about how to have an impact in the real world when I graduated uh, coming out of MIT. And so, you know, people were really excited about the work I had done there. Uh, I had a first paper author in science, which is, you know, a, uh, a big deal. We had a patent. Um, but when I went to McKinsey and Company, um, the reason why I went was because I really wasn't sure how the work I had done for five years was actually going to change the world. You know, we had synthesized uh, with a collaborator 0.3 grams of a polymer. Um, my research was around creating ceramic nanostructures from block copolymers. And yes, Binda, we did that two years ago, right? Um, and what I was really trying to uh, figure out is how do we use self-assemble techniques to create new high temperature performance materials? And um, it was really uh, great work because we had a chance to mathematically kind of uh, simulate what these uh, block copolymer structures could look like. And then what I was able to do as an experimentalist was show that they 
um, they exist in real life. But if you're to ask me how was that going to actually drive commercial impact or make a difference in the world, I wasn't sure. And I was really hungering for uh, knowledge on how to do that. And so the idea was I'd go to McKinsey & Company for two years, really understand uh, what the real world is uh, doing, and then I would use it to become a, a better applied researcher at a university. However, I ended up going there for 13 years because my very first study was a tech transfer study, and I was helping a, a company uh, figure out how to um, drive commercial impact from the investments that they were making. And uh, I will tell you that my transition to McKinsey was a really rocky one. Um, and it was really rocky because a lot of the real world skills that you need to thrive uh, in the real world were not taught at all to me. Um, and I had to kind of learn them on the fly. And so what I wanted to do today was really uh, talk about, you know, why there is that disconnect. So in the real world, you know, we are really trying to drive impact, but the students' world is really different, right? They're focused on GPAs. Can you score high on a test? How many classes are you taking? The number of majors you have, that's really what undergrads are focused on. In the real world, uh, most places don't care what your GPA is, maybe for your first job, but in reality, nobody really cares. Uh, you're not promoted based on being the smartest person in the room. And EQ is actually far more important than IQ in terms of your ability to move organizations and to drive change. And it's these soft skills that are really uh, what is going to drive success. And we do not formally teach them at all in, uh, in academic institutions. And the reality is when seniors graduate, 85% of job success is coming from these well-developed soft skills. And only 15% comes from technical skills and knowledge. And Google had done some work to look at what are the 10 traits of successful people. And then if you look at it, only one of the 10 traits has to do with technical skills. So if we really are going to drive impact in the world, how do we formally drive the other nine traits and teach uh, our engineering and science students the kinds of things they need in order to really have an impact? And so my goal when I was uh, an educator um, in, in, uh, at Penn was really complement the deep technical skills that all the academic institutions know how to do and complement them with readiness in the workplace. And so I took a basically three-pronged approach, which I'm going to share with you today. One was uh, to revamp uh, one of the courses I taught, which is a senior design uh, curriculum. Second was to uh, think about new ways to kind of scale through project competitions beyond just my department, and then really thinking about ways that we bring industry into it. So let me start with the senior design curriculum. So um, when I was asked to come to Penn, uh, one of the classes I was given was senior design, which I was really excited about because it's the first time most engineers are, they don't have a curriculum, meaning, you know, they're really told just go work on a research project and see what you can do. And I was like, this is a perfect backbone to actually build out a lot of the themes that I think we need to drive workplace readiness. And I'm going to share with you three mindsets that I was formally teaching, as well as soft or, uh, you know, real world skills that I think uh, also really critical. So in terms of mindset, most of the time that I spent uh, at um, McKinsey was really with CTOs um, who uh, had organizations that were completely full of PhDs. And um, unfortunately, when you go get a PhD, I actually think is a little bit anti-commercialization. And why do I say that? No, that's a controversial statement. The reason why I say that is we all join a research group that is focused on one technology. In my case, it was block copolymers. And so every single PhD student was working on block copolymers and uh, it was seen as the best you know, thing out there for um, a variety of things. And as a result, that focus is on one technology. Secondly, when you're doing uh, research, you're told don't talk to anyone about your research, especially if you want to go for a science paper because you don't want to get scooped. Now, if you want to commercialize technologies, the last thing you should do is just sit in your lab by yourself doing research. You have to go talk to the real world, but you're told for five, six years, don't talk to anyone. And the last thing that you do when you're getting your PhD is you defend your PhD. You're defensive. Defensiveness is the opposite of collaboration. And so I think there's just a mindset that is really driving us to be more technology versus market uh, 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 versus market pull. And so really um, the you know, way we're trained is let's think about what we've invented and let's push it out to the market. And I spend a lot of time retraining engineers to be like, okay, forget about the technology you're working on. What's the problem we have to solve in the real world? Let's be technology agnostic. 
you know, let's not care about what your pet projects are or the things that you're working on. Let's ask ourselves, what are the problems we have to solve and use that to guide us, right? to the patents that we actually want to drive towards. So that mindset of market pull versus technology push is really critical. And so the way in which I was really teaching that for our students was I'd share material science vignettes of how innovation was done. Here's an example of a company um, in Latin America where they saw there's all this trash out there. They actually, uh, and they also have a housing shortage for, uh, for inexpensive housing. So they were taking all this trash and creating Lego bricks, right? These massive bricks made out of um, uh, all this uh, landfill uh, plastic and using them to build really inexpensive houses in a week. So that is, you know, examples of the kinds of commercialization and problems I was having people look at and ask, how do we aim material science towards it? I also would spend a lot of time talking about the nuances of materials commercialization. Uh, one of the challenges is that you may invent something that really benefits the consumer, but there's all these other people in between that you have to convince to adopt the technology before the consumer ever sees it. So there's a catch 22 because if you go to OEM say I have this great technology solution, it's amazing, we wanna put into cars, the OEM would be like, that's great, is there a stable supply chain? You go to the stable supply chain saying, there's this amazing material you guys need to adopt to sell the OEMs, like great, will the OEM take an offtake agreement? So understanding the nuances of materials commercialization was extremely important. I also forced them to talk to the market so for their senior theses, they had to call dozens of people to really understand what the problems are and how the work they were doing could solve it. Um, I also was looking at formal partnerships with industry. I'll talk about that a little bit. And all of this was to really frame the problem senior design in the real world, asking themselves throughout the entire year, why are they trying to uh, solve this problem and how is their technology going to solve it? The second uh, mindset that I was really pushing hard on was test and learn versus perfect planning. I found this myself when I was an engineer is I would read a ton of papers. I need to know anything before I could speak. If we do that, you get long lead times. You have a lot of uh, uh, challenges, right? Uh, in terms of actually getting stuff done. And so getting them into the mindset of uh, perfection is the opposite of progress was really important. And so I would do things like you have to deliver your first result. What will it be? The scrappier, the better. And we do some problems solving sessions around, you know, let's talk about solar silt. What's the easiest prototype that you could build? And I got them into the mindset where literally this is an amazing prototype, right? This was a uh, group that was trying to figure out how would they uh, potentially bubble gas into a um, into a reactor and they created this really simple prototype and it was just getting them the mindset of when you're building something, it doesn't have to be perfect. The third mindset, which I think is really, really critical, is um, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. Um, in uh, the pre-K to 12 education system, uh, we really kind of get people more into fixed mindset because we're really focused on GPA. And a fixed mindset is one where you're more focused on your outcomes versus learning. You uh, believe you're either good at something you're not. And as a result, you get really frustrated uh, and will give up if things aren't going well, or even worse, you refuse to do things you're not great at. Growth mindset is really looking more about um, learning things and worrying less if you're perfect at something and just trying hard to try new things. And so really small things made a big difference to shift this. So one of the things that I did was um, in class, uh, everyone had to speak. And so you had to say something. And so once you said something, I threw you a tennis ball and you could not leave my classroom until you held a tennis ball. And if you held a tennis ball, you weren't allowed to speak because extroverts oftentimes take a lot of the airtime. So a lot of the introverts in my class um, would oftentimes not speak because they're afraid of looking stupid, but I really was forcing them. So by the end of, you know, the sixth or seventh lecture, everyone was speaking, even the introverts, because they were forced to, and they started getting more natural at it. Um, we started driving more accountability. Uh, so in the real world, if I decide not to go to a meeting, uh, uh, people will notice because that is part of my job. And so a lot of what professors do is they have um, more of the uh, class attendance be a bigger part of the percentage so that people actually will come to class. And I was like, look, you know, I don't get paid more by going to meetings. I'm expected to. And so uh, if you weren't going to join my class, you had to tell me 24 hours in advance unless it's an emergency. And there had to be a good reason why. It had to be an excused absence. And 
if you didn't turn up, I would take 2% off your final grade because that is what happens in the real world is if you don't show up for things, you people start noticing, you start getting uh, penalized for it. And so really driving that accountability, what I thought was really important. And we also uh, started having other uh, um, uh, students start to critique and give input and feedback into everyone others, uh, each other's work. And so it really got to the mindset of collaboration, the mindset of needing to grow with each other. And these small things, uh, and they're all very small, when you do a lot of them in a the classroom, really Really starts getting to a mindset change and this is something i'm really passionate about so when i was uh given the honor of uh giving penn's commencement speech in 2018 i actually spent a lot of time talking about why gpa doesn't matter and i know that's pretty controversial coming from uh, an engineering professor and i also was really trying to demystify failing uh and said it was very natural like we all do it and it's similar to farting and it went viral and I'm really excited about this because of the fact that it's really demystifying failure. And so if you want to learn more, you can see the commencement speech there. Um, but I've had uh, students all over the world reach out. In fact, uh, people who are, you know, are in um, similar age to me and Bindu who are excited that, you know, a reframing of failing is really helping with the mindset to drive towards growth. So the next thing I want to share is like, what are the soft skills that, you know, I was really trying to build in senior design and I won't go through these, but you'll recognize these for anyone who's spent any time in the real and complicated world. These are the things that we need to know in order to drive towards impact. And so what I was really trying to do was make sure we're building all these kinds of skills through our senior theses. And I was evolving as I went. So in the first year, I actually was negotiating um, my contract as the school had actually started. So I had to co-teach uh, my first year um, and was uh, seeing a curriculum that I didn't really think was building the real world skills we need needed. So I did a timeout in second semester, said I'm you know, throwing up the existing curriculum and here's the real world skills I think they need and really focus on amazing presentation, self-reflection, and how do you frame the technology in the real world? What was really exciting uh, was that AB actually came to uh, review us at the end of the my first year that I was there and they actually ID'd uh, the work I was doing at senior design as something that was really critical uh, to uh, do more of because this workplace readiness was something that was novel and they want to see more of. The even more exciting thing is that um, in the um, 25 years that Penn Engineering has had a senior design competition where every single department puts forth three uh, teams to compete, material science and engineering had never placed, not once. Um, and what was exciting is we got second place in my first year that I was there, and it wasn't because my, my students were any smarter. I teach them how to give presentations and, com and communicate, which was great. And the impact I saw on my teaching evaluations was great too. They really were recognizing why this was important. So in the second year, um, I decided, look, let's have our projects be chosen at the end of junior year, because if you start choosing them in the beginning of senior year, you run out of time. I would not allow any individual projects uh, because I think team based work is really critical. I create the entire curriculum to build out these skills. And I started to caucus uh, all of us around and the engineering school that were leading senior design to ask, uh, to ask and push, can we do this more thoughtfully and programmatically across the, uh, across the school? What was exciting was in that year, we went first and third. Um, and that was really transformational because usually there's another department, mechanical engineering, that wins everything. And so for material science, to actually take first and third was enormous. I started uh, giving more talks about real world skills, started getting some coverage on it. People were very excited about this angle. And then I was recognized as one of the top 20 undergrad teachers in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, which to me was the most important thing because it meant students were understanding how this was important. Um, so at the end of my second year, I started to bring everyone together and really try to think about how do we actually drive interdisciplinary senior design teams. Up until this point, it was siloed where every department had their own senior design teams, very few um, uh, cross roughing between departments, but that's not how the real world works. The real world, there is multiple disciplines working together. I also thought it was important for corporate sponsors to come in because I really want the students to see what the real world problems are. And so, you know, in the third year, 
Um, we had a record number of interdisciplinary senior design projects. Um, a third of my uh, students in, um, in senior design were actually not material science and engineering. And I uh, had a lot of companies actually share their problems and the students started working on these. We also started to coordinate curriculum across the engineering school. And I was really excited to uh, refine the curriculum uh, beyond senior design. And I was the undergrad chair of the material science department. Uh, I'd become that at the end of my first year, which was a big deal because I'm a non-tenured, non-research professor. Um, I do have an endowed chair, but you know, it's the first time that a non-tenured, non-research professor was an undergrad chair, but I wanted to do that so I could drive curriculum design. And the big thing I want to share is we did a huge thing where we went from 40 uh, CUs, that was what's required for graduation, and we dropped it down to 37 uh, CUs across the entire engineering school. Why is that a big deal is normally in uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, you only need 32 credit units to actually graduate, whereas in engineering school you need 40, so it's always a badge of honor. However, what I really wanted to do was tell students, take the extra three credit units and use that time to build a passion project at Penn. So a passion project could be founding a startup, creating a new STEM program, developing a movie, it doesn't matter. But the, 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 the key about this is we really, really, really want you to be thinking about ways in which you can build out real world skills beyond the classroom. And so you know, the second thing that I did, so that was what the work that was being done in the Chill Science and Engineering Department's undergrad chair. I also wanted to figure out ways that we could scale beyond the engineering school. And so um, I created Penn's first Makerthon. And the goal is to inspire and educate student uh, teams across multiple disciplines to develop hardware solutions for pressing medical issues. And this was founded by Jonathan Rothberg um, in terms of the funding that he had given for us to catalyze this. And here's the real world skills that would be covering uh, through this. And so we shared with them, here are the healthcare problems, um, provided people they could interview and talk to. Uh, we had design studios so they could understand how to prototype. Um, and then uh, we developed some early prototypes we uh, had uh, um, a weekend where they could get prototype feedback uh, from the public when that allowed them to do uh, iterative um, innovation. So they would have the entire weekend, all the maker spaces at Penn Engineering were available, and then they could then iterate um, in order to get to a better solution. And of course, this was all driven by a lot of late night snacks. And the thing that was exciting about this, we had over 300 students participate across seven schools um, uh, um, around Penn, and this goes back to the interdisciplinary, um, you know, nature of the work that we did, and we had three catalyzers and a ton of mentors, judges, and collaborators driving all of this. And it lets amazing opportunities for our students. I mean, this one just blew me away, where we had a, a team of freshmen, uh, so uh, four uh, first years, who had developed this uh, um, IoT platform, and they literally had done it over a weekend. They then got so excited about the work, they actually pitched at Y Combinator and got accepted into the 2019 summer cohort. And that got a little bit trouble because three of those students took a leave of absence from Penn Engineering in order to uh, pursue the Y Combinator. And so the dean was joking with me, okay, you can't keep doing things like this where our students are leaving, but Y Combinator is one of the most uh, prestigious opportunity to get out there. Uh, they have completely pivoted uh, the uh, idea, but the fact that the Rothberg Catalyzer catalyzed that was really exciting. And so lastly, I want to share, you know, the things we're doing to really drive a new model for industry partnerships. Um, coming from uh, the private sector, I think it's critical for students to learn about the real world. And so for me, uh, you know, I saw Comcast was, you know, eight blocks away from Penn, and we had really not never really collaborated with them in a programmatic way. And so I got to know the CTO, Tony Warner, quite well. And here's the things that they're trying to drive towards, which really matches with what Penn Engineering is trying to do. And so, you know, what we did was created a multi-level partnership, which I won't go into details with you, but um, it led to some really incredible opportunities. And the one I'm going to sh showcase for you is I had a student um, in my internal entrepreneurship class. That's another other class that I teach, who came to me and said, hey, I have this technology I want to work on for senior design, where I can take um, video uh, camera feeds and uh, de-identify people and make them into kind of moving uh, objects, and I can kind of predict uh, actions that they'll be taking using AI and machine learning. I really want to aim it towards um, 
uh, anti-violence and security and uh, the security area. So I've uh, already spoken to the chief of police at Penn to see if I can get access to their video feeds and so forth. I just happened to have Leon Lai in my um, office that day from Comcast. He's the VP of AI. And I asked him to come uh, help uh, judge that year's senior design competition. I was like, hey, you know, told my student, why don't you come to my office at this time? I actually want you to introduce you to someone. So Leon uh, sat uh, down with the student and said, hey, uh, uh, tell me about your idea. And Leon said, said actually, this would be amazing for uh, uh, anti-shoplifting because one of the issues is there's a lot of bias around trying to identify who's shoplifting. If you can de-identify everyone, this would be amazing. And they had a really great conversation. That student in uh, less than 24 hours put together a seven page proposal on this, which I sent to Leon. And Leon was like, oh my gosh, I will be this, uh, this person's sponsor in terms of helping them think about stuff. They were not at all interested in the IP or anything. Like, I just want to help a really top-notch student think about this. So he built out a team, the student did, and I mentored him throughout his uh, time uh, working on steer design along with um, uh, Tony at Comcast. And at the end of the year, he created a company called Percepta and then uh, entered a, bit, a bunch of pitch competitions, one of which was uh, at Wharton. And when he was pitching, ADM approached and said, we're uh, ADT approach, and they were very interested in it. So over the course of the summer, at the end of his senior year, after he had graduated, uh, I helped him to broker a million dollar investment from ADT, which he's 21, 22 at that point. And that is the power of industry collaboration. And he has learned a ton over the past year as he's been building out his company. But these are the kinds of opportunities I think we need to drive towards. And why do I think all of this kind of stuff is what we need to be doing in academia is we don't want to graduate excellent sheep. When we are driving towards GPA curriculums, go study for the test and deliver and regurgitate answers, that is excellent sheep. We really want to graduate amazing alpha dogs, those who have the real world skills and really know how to actually um, work in the real world and have real impact. And so that's where I think we have to go. And a lot of the work I'm doing here at the Department of Energy is driving a new mindset and new thinking so we can have more of a commercial impact from all of the research investments that are being made here. So thanks, and uh, hopefully we have time for a few questions. Thank you very much, um, Vanessa, uh, for your remarks. That was very interesting. You. Um, um, spend a lot of time telling us about the programs, the very creative programs that you have developed for students. I would think that an equally important aspect of this is how we um, train faculty to uh, change your mindset to become more uh, entrepreneurial, and also um, how universities try to uh, incentivize this type of activity. What are your thoughts on that, and what have you done at Penn and other places to try to change that mindset? Excellent question, Juan. Um, this is uh, a lot trickier because unfortunately it's above my pay grade uh, when I was uh, at Penn, uh, but it's something which I think is absolutely crucial. And it's something that I've spoken to uh, Penn leadership about is when you're in the real world, there is a ton of uh, programming to really drive professional development. And so when I was there, I had a chance, you know, at uh, at McKinsey to constantly uh, have self-reflection. People telling me what was working, what wasn't, and and McKinsey is really amazing at uh, training and professional development for people. You know, in academia, my training consisted of you know going to a half day um, to kind of just get me up to speed on what Penn is. I met. A uh, dozen other faculty that you know were also joining at the same time, but there really wasn't the um, professional development that you need in order to be impactful. You look at most universities, right? You become uh, a professor; it's the first time you're leading a team. There's no training on that, right? It's not a formal thing, and it's tricky. So, uh, Juan, you're in a position to change this at your university. So, I really think faculty professional development is a huge opportunity because this is a generation that. Is training the next generation. So if we don't change um, and build the mindset and the real world skills in them, how do we expect to build the next generations? I agree completely. Uh, Vanessa, let me ask you a different question. At the beginning of your presentation, you um, explained that um, we spend a lot of time with students teaching them their technical skills that they need to have. But when they go to work, 
I think the numbers that you gave us were that 85% um, of what matters is what you call the EQ and 15% are their technical skills. On the uh, technical side of things, we know that teaching uh, calculus and physics and chemistry to a student takes X number of years. We have a very clear idea of what that is. On the EQ side, I think we understand less about how long it takes to prepare a student to be uh, effective. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, when should we start introducing these skills to make sure that they learn them well? I think it goes back once again to um, faculty training, right? Uh, so uh, I think people need to be given the opportunity to kind of learn these things on the fly and uh, have coaches that are sitting in on faculty meetings or even in uh, grad student uh, groups to get the feedback. So um, a lot of the way you learn is by doing. And so understanding and uh, situations um, and getting knowledge through role playing of how you might handle some of these things. I think even better, um, quite frankly, and I hesitate to say this, and that's why I didn't say it's my first answer is because we really would have to change academia for this. I would love for professors to actually not uh, spend 100% of their time focused in just academia. So even more ideal is that if every single PhD student uh, goes into the real world, I would actually say the corporate world, and spend two years working there, and that no faculty member will be hired unless they have two years of real world experience. And I don't mean like working in another, um, you know, uh, uh, academic institution on sabbatical. I mean, going into real world trying to build something. I think the EQ blossoms when you go through that. I will tell you, my first year at McKinsey is when my EQ started really firing up, because there's all kinds of things that I was making mistakes on because I had not enough EQ. And so the only way you get it is by um, doing it um, and just kind of like exercising. People can theoretically tell you what exercises and teach it in the classroom, but until you're actually exercising, you actually are not building that muscle memory. So any way in which we can, can get our faculty out into the real world, meaning the corporate world, startups, that would really uh, force them to build it because they will not thrive uh, without EQ if they go into those environments. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. We have another question from the audience. Let me uh, read it to you. At what point in your education and early career did you decide that you wanted to exist at the intersection of academia and industry in technology transfer? Um, so, you know, it's one of the things where uh, my career is kind of like a brownie in motion random walk, but then when you take a step back, like, oh, that makes a ton of sense. So I want to say there was a lot of kind of thoughtful decisions uh, around this, um, but I will tell you, it's kind of opportunities just presented themselves. I kind of went with it. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, um, I was really being uh, groomed or being encouraged to become a research professor, but I was really having a trouble with my PhD and the lack of impact that I saw that it really had, and people being so excited that I published in science. And I was like, uh, okay, that's great, but I don't know how it's changing the world. So I actually went to do a postdoc um, uh, in Germany to see if it's any different. But before I went to do a postdoc, uh, a friend of mine, I was in the middle of writing up my PhD, uh, dragged me uh, to McKinsey and Company and said, look, you know, let's go to this presentation. I wasn't at all interested. And they told me there's free cocktail shrimp. And for, you know, those of you back in the day, I was making $18,000 a year. I could not afford a cocktail shrimp. So I went there and met these amazing people that really were trying to think about impact. And so I interviewed, got the job, but told them I wanted to do a postdoc in Germany. And they're like, that's fine. You know, defer your offer if you decide to to come just let us know and in germany i was kind of feeling the same thing where you know research in europe uh was also quite similar to the us where it's very very much focused on the technical aspect of it and so as i mentioned i thought i'd you know spend two years uh at mckinsey but my very first study was for a company that was spending a lot of money on a technology it was measuring nox socks um carbon dioxide carbon monoxide aimed towards the auto industry the issue is that when you're trying to uh, go towards auto it takes about five years from when you have a concept and we actually realize revenues from uh, it being uh, put in the car and being rolled off the production line. So their question was, how do we have an impact in the meanwhile? How do we make some money on this um, 
technology. And that's where I really got to understand technology and understand what the problems are in the real world and how do I connect that technology solution to those problems. And that was when uh, that's technology transfer, right? So I was like, wow, this is the itch I've been looking for it um, to be scratched is how do we drive impact from research uh, uh, dollars? And so the work that, you know, I did at McKinsey was really helping uh, to crystallize that. And now here at the Department of Energy, it's the same thing, right? Where we have a ton of amazing, incredible research, but uh, scientists and engineers, right, are not sure how to get it out the door. And so kind of there's a culmination of all this where it's all about uh, having a North Star around what's important to you. And to me, it's always been about having impact in the world. And that's why technology transfer was something I kind of stumbled upon because it was a personal journey. I was frustrated by the lack of impact I had, and I now see all the work that's being done across the world on this. And it's really about how do we drive it? And so that's really how I got to uh, technology transfer was a, a desire for all the amazing technical work that we're doing to actually get out in the real world and actually make a difference. Well, thank you, Vanessa. We're at the end of our time. Uh, your uh, presentation was thought provoking. Your ideas are very interesting and I hope we can actually pursue some of them here at the PME and at the University of Chicago. Thank you very much.